here in the Kalbach Shul in West 79th Street, the same Kalbach Shul that was started by your great-grandfather, Naftali, and continued with your grandfather, Eli Chaim, and Reb Shlomo, and now with you. Tell us about how you remember growing up here and how did it all transition into what it is now? One of the things I would do is I would visit my uh, grandparents uh, for, for Yom Tovim, for holidays, for Shabbat, and, and um, they were part of the community and yet from a different world. So I'd, I'd get off the subway coming in from either Crown Heights or it was in Marstown. It was studying in a Chabad Yeshiva in New Jersey. And Upper West Side was a very vibrant place there. It wasn't as wealthy as it is today. So there were a lot of artists and hippies. And there were still some areas that were not considered so safe. And then this shul was like a magnet for some of those hippies. And uh, a small core of families, which you were one of, and uh, my grandfather, my grandmother somehow... Elichayim and Hadassah. Elichayim and Hadassah, they somehow kind of worked with it. They worked with the fact that Elichayim's brother, Shlomo, was, was, was world famous, uh, but yet he wasn't here much half of the time. And my grandmother was the glue that put the food together and whatever type of membership. It wasn't even a membership for the most part. It was just a, it was a hodgepodge of people that would give a dollar or, or, or $50 or nothing at all. She was a sergeant. She held it together. She was tough, still is tough. She was the gvura. She was the, uh, she was the rules and what would otherwise have been a wild west, particularly because of her brother-in-law, Shlomo, who was love and openness, no boundaries, no rules. So she was the counterbalance, and she made up for all of that That uh, love. She put it in order. And that's also, why the shul is still here. But also your grandfather was of a different world. My grandfather was a little bit like the bub of a Rebbe on the Upper West Side. There was something about him very charming and uh, also very direct in his approach with the Ribbona Shalom, with, with God. So when he, would, when he would daven, it was as if he was talking to the beloved. You could, just, you, you, could, you could just feel it. You could just see him davening. And um, there's a beautiful teaching that there's two ways that people inspire. One is they work on inspiring. And the other way is they just do whatever it is that they do, and automatically other the people who watch it are in awe. So my grandfather, when he would pray, he wasn't trying to impress anyone. He was just, that's the way he davened. That's the way he prayed. And it was so beyond what, what we're used to seeing. That's the chassid part of them. But he was also a starker. Like Reb Shlomo was, his brother, his twin brother, was more like no boundaries, anything goes, love, peace, happy. And your grandfather was a very, he was teaching in yeshiva, um, and he lived a very much more ordinary kind of orthodox rabbinic life. Yeah, I mean, in general, one of the beautiful things of, of the Hasidic movement is, it, for the most part, it, it keeps within the rules. There's a few areas in which it, it takes some liberties, like the time of prayer. But other than that, they follow the Shulchan Aruch, but the renegade is to not to rebel on the outside, but on the inside, it's, it's the quest for authenticity. Mm -hmm. So even though he, on the outside, looked like some people would come in here who were afraid to come in here because of the reputation of it being uh, too, too nonconformist, and they would see him and they'd be, oh, okay, good, we're okay now. <laughs> We have a very orthodox, you know, more than orthodox, ultra. You want to, if you, I hate the word, but if you want to, you want to use this terrible word. Say somebody who looks like they're ultra orthodox. They covered both ends. He says, "You want to orthodox? You go to Elichaim. You want a spiritual? Go to Reb Shlomo." But here's the thing: he looked like he was out of Me'ah Sharim, out of the most religious neighborhood in Israel. But at the same time, once you talk to him, the softness oh. was 
was without that, measure. That's why we were here, because he kept it really together. Um, I remember the first Pesach I was here. I was actually visiting, I think, the set. I don't remember exactly. It was 1984, probably. It's the first time I saw it. I didn't grow up with that. Mm -hmm. And he said he took a piece of matzo, the first bite, leaned on the left, and he took a bite, and he says, oh, that's what heaven must taste like. And I thought, mm. it's a piece of matzo. When the stories in the Torah become so real, you actually taste the heaven and the matzo. And that was something, there's um, something about his relationship with Yiddishkeit, with Torah, with, with, with uh, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with, with Judaism and, and, and the Torah and God, that those of us who were there just saw how sweet it was. I mean, him and Shlomo had a lot of similarities. They both came to approaching their relationship with, with the holy as something that's not so much to be afraid of, but to be embraced, to love. So they were, in that sense, like the Baal Shem Tov, each one in their own way. One was maybe looking on the right, another one on the left. Those are just the labels. On the inside, they both had this depth of, of love that came across to those Where who worked with them. Where did they get it from? Them. I think it was just in them. But you know, they, your, your great-grandfather, great Naftali, wasn't like that, was he? He well, was a very yek I never yekish. met him. I never met him because he was uh, he, he left this world before I was even born. I'm named after him. Right. And in the Ashkenazic tradition, that only happens when uh, that person's already gone from this world. He, he really did teach them a lot. He did. One of the things that my grandmother says, my grandmother came from the Schneerson family, right. Hadassah, and you'd think Chabad, the Schneersons, probably very warm, but actually it was the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I came from a very cold intellectual family into a very warm, even though you'd expect a German family to be cold. Sometimes... Fam op yeah, I mean, the truth is, Russians can be kind of cold, and Germans can, can, can be warm. It, it could go either way. The Germans who left Germany. Well, thank God they left. They left just in time. But yes, they, they already had a certain, there was a certain quality that they had. Not everybody in the family had it. We don't have to get into the dynamics. But the, the siblings and their father, they enjoyed a very warm yeah. relationship that... Uh, that came over, and also, for example, they, they would talk about the way their father would treat everybody. They would, he, sometimes somebody would come into the synagogue to ask for a donation. And it wasn't just that he needed $5 or a dollar. It was somebody who was known to be kind of like a professional, professional scam artist. Sure. You know, like somebody who would tell you a whole story that wasn't, most of it wasn't true. And everybody knew that this was the case. But my great-grandfather, Naftali Kalbach, would we'd put on his, his suit and his tie, and he would meet them, and he would listen to them. He would give them the ultimate in respect, and he would give them something. It wasn't so much about the giving, because he would have given, but it was more about how he treated each person. He gave each person dignity. So they learned that everybody has to be respected. Tell us, how did you get to where you are? Tell us your story. So I would come visit the shul, spend time with my grandparents, and then uh, after my grandfather passed away, I uh, would come to the shul and spend more time with Shlomo. I had already had known Shlomo, but I didn't know on, on a, every week or every other week, which was more like when he would be here, the amount of deep inspirational teachings and the method of his prayer, not just as songs, but as a, again, like my grandfather, but he was able to communicate it into his songs, a way of feeling a connection between Shlomo and, and God. So I was able to be here and witness that. I was learning at that time in 770, Eastern Parkway, the Chabad Yeshiva getting my smicha. That was a time that the Lubavitcher Rebbe had suffered a stroke and was unable to communicate and only, only was able to use some of his body. And it was a very hard time for those who were in Chabad at that time. So How old were you then? I was 22, 21, 22. And I made it a point to be here on Shabbos because here I felt, uh, I, felt I had this unique 
opportunity not just to spend time with my grandmother, which I did, but to, to really get to know Shlomo very well, to, 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 to learn from him, not just as a musician or somebody who loved a lot of people of Israel because he had a big heart, but, but as, a, as a Rebbe. As he a was teacher. a Gadol B'Torah. He was a great scholar, and he was a great interpreter of, of the text, and he, um, he digested it, and he gave it over from deep within himself. Did he get along with the Dasa? No. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he respected her. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, they needed each other. They, 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 Two they forces were, of nature. No, no. I mean, it's not, it's not like they were fighting the whole time, but, but, but he, he probably would have made the shul more, I don't know, more universal. Um, How much actually, more universal could it be? I mean, you came I don't here, know. I don't you know, know, this morning there was nobody here. There was a Shnorer who was the door. Because he knew that here maybe he yeah, can maybe get, he something. get something. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what it is. Shlomo had, had this passion for innovating. At the same time, he didn't want to like, he knew that there's certain things in the fabric of Judaism that if you take them down, we're not clear what will happen afterwards. So he didn't. Take so he it only all the innovated. Way down. Yeah, there's people who talk about why didn't he go further? Why didn't he challenge the halacha more? And the answer is, is that his challenge wasn't with the halacha. It was with us. It was with with us to make us feel what Yiddishkeit is really about, not just to practice it, but to to be it, to embody it. It's surprising to hear it coming from a rabbi. I would have expected to hear it from a hippie. You know, he didn't go far enough, but here, an Orthodox rabbi, who obviously you are Kalbach in inside out, but you think that he held back. The Orthodox world doesn't think that he held back. They think that he went too far. Well, I think that the Orthodox world is interesting because he went too far in his lifetime, but Mot Kedoshim, after he passed away, I think the Orthodox world is grateful that he didn't go further. <laughs> so they took him back. They're like, well, you know, this, he is a great man. He, he, he is a great... He, he is a great no choice. Of all, of their, all of the Talmudim are singing and praying yeah, his style. Yeah, but, the, but part of that is a recognition that he recognized the authenticity of halacha and didn't say, yeah, you don't need this anymore. There, there are other people, I don't have to name them, who were similar in style to kind of looking for the ruchniyut, looking for the spirituality, and they kept looking and looking until they went out of the sphere of halacha. Not that Shlomo didn't press the boundaries in, in some areas. He did, but overall, he kept saying, I don't believe that we need to like break the rules. So you think that Reb Zalman, his partner from the early 50s, as being shalichim of, of the Rebbe, he went too far? It's all relative. Too yeah. far to, well, from what? Compared to compared Shlomo. To Shlomo uh, Zalman Schechter, who was Shlomo's close, probably his closest friend, that's what Shlomo himself told me, that Zalman is his, his friend, his only friend, he actually told me, meaning on his level, yes. uh, went much further than Shlomo. He went post-denominational, he went beyond halacha. Again, that doesn't mean he said you shouldn't keep halacha if you want to, but he didn't feel it was, it was something that was absolutely necessary. You read his book, The Governor? The, the I, I, I I read a number of his books. Now he's he's written quite a few books. Yeah. I have not read all of them. No stuff anyway. Yeah. So what's amazing to me is that you portray Shlomo in a quite a surprising way as somebody who is bound by Alacha. We we knew that he was observant Jew, but he broke the biggest rule. You know the thing that leads to mixed dancing. You know the. Yeah. He, he called Isha. He sang with his daughter. He was criticized for that. And you're saying this was still okay. I think Shlomo, he lived on the edge of halacha. He lived on the edge of halacha. He actually believed in halacha, and he believed that halacha could be somewhat open in certain circumstances. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit complicated. He didn't necessarily always look for a rationale to explain why he was doing it. There are certain times in his life where he probably went beyond halacha to do what he felt he needed to do. Do you feel that it's okay? Not necessarily. So let's say he's feminist by 
you know, uh, denominational, like women of the wall, uh, singing, women singing, where do you... I, I think that a lot of these things that Shlomo was on the forefront of, he felt that it's not a question of right or wrong. He felt that it's a question of people who want to have a relationship with Judaism, and if the establishment on, on the Orthodox establishment is the only voice that excludes them, they will feel alienated. And he wanted to make sure that they, that they had a friend in him. It wasn't so much political. He was motivated. Okay. So he to, wasn't poskin. He wasn't he making was, a lot of, He wasn't poskin. He, he was or, com- he ordained women. He, right. he ordained women because he, he, to him, again, how you interpret this is know. very sticky. How do you interpret it? Well, I don't know because it's a work in progress, but there's a, there's a, there's a statement that loving, loving your fellow Israelite as yourself, or even just your fellow yeah. as yourself is the, Torah is the Torah. biggest principle of Torah, which means that every time you do any act or any halacha, any observant act, it should be a detail of that core value of loving other people. Now, sometimes it seems to contradict the application of a particular law seems to contradict loving other people. And then you have to reconcile it, and then you have to struggle with it. I think each generation has to struggle with it differently. So now with our generation, we have Maharat, we have Drisha, we have Chovevei, we have Women of the Wall, we have a lot of opportunities for women to break the boundaries of halacha, still within what they consider halachic, because it was sure. not really out of the boundaries, it was just not practiced. But there was nothing wrong. Uh, Cook, Rev Cook said that it's okay. It was just that once upon a time, Minhag Israel yeah. was that women were in, in the kitchen and men were in the yeah. shul, so they became yeah. a Minhag. But is there something halachically correct in it moving now in a time? You know, the Karl Bach Shul, women were the core here, right? Yeah. So is there your feeling halakhically that it's moving is, in that well, direction? Ultimately, women are going to be fully involved in, in, in every area of, of Jewish observance. But I think that there still may be room for certain traditional boundaries, like a mechitza, like even a non-egalitarian service. And I say that because we, at the same time, that there are many areas that women can excel in. So, for example, a, a woman can become a great Torah scholar. Now, in some communities, they wouldn't allow that because they'd say a woman is limited in what she's supposed to study. I would take issue with that because I would say the gedolim of the last generation, each one in a different way, have begun to open up either fully or partially the access of women to Torah. So I would, that would be the first thing that I would emphasize is, is women's role as students and teachers of Torah. So for you, a woman who comes out with a title Rava, or whatever it's called, uh, being some form of women ordination, is that okay for, with you? I have no problem with, with having women certified as Torah scholars so that they can feel more confident to teach Torah, to help people, to, to give them advice in halacha, and so on. How about Neshama? Is it your cousin or your... My cousin. Your cousin. Yeah, yeah. So you, your cousin was just here. And that she... doesn't mean I have no problem in the application and the details. It means, in theory, you right. give a woman a, a PhD in the university, you could give her some certification to say she's gone through a course of learning and she's mastered a certain material to, give her, to, to make her officially a teacher. I wouldn't necessarily want to call it a rabbi at this point. What is the definition of smicha? Smicha is just kind of a, a little residue of what used to be right, the right. real smicha. Right. So if your cousin Neshama sinks, mm-hmm. do you walk out? Do you feel you, you can I, stay in? I, where, where, I where don't do you... walk out, but I respect the people who walk out. I res- Halacha is complicated. So for example, Life is when, we, when we got a, the, the shul hosts Neshama to sing, right. at least once a year, right. right? If not more. Right. 
what's the rationale now that Shlomo just allowed it? He didn't think of I'm going to I'm going to find you the way in the Shulchan Aruch that it's allowed, even though there there are many ways in the Shulchan Aruch. Shulchan Aruch is very broad. The the main commentary on that section of Shulchan Aruch, Evan Ezer, that talks about not women singing, says that the prohibition against women singing is possibly only at the time of prayer. Which, if that, that's true, we have a problem here. But if it's not the time of prayer, according to that opinion, uh, that's not an issue. There's a more contemporary resp- uh, halachic response to this issue, which is, if you, in fact, are not used to hearing women singing, then no. continue to not listen right. to women singing, because it might, but that's I don't know. True. That's but true about if, minhag of Tom anyway. But it's more like in the line, there's Aruch HaShulchan, uh, that I believe it's the Aruch HaShulchan that says, if you live in a community where the women don't cover their hair, and there are women with uncovered hair, and you can see their uncovered hair at the time of prayer, because you're accustomed to seeing it, 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 it no longer is considered seeing a, a pri- a, an area of a woman that's normally covered. So it beca- there is, within halacha, a framework to say something like that for kol isha as well. So halacha accepts reality. Halacha does not accept reality, but at certain times it uh, it no can choice. it it can listen to the reality, and that under certain circumstances, not all the time, can it, it can it adjust to something because of, of 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 a situation. So practically speaking, if I'm uploading an interview that has you and Neshama in it, and in the interview Neshama sings. Is it kosher or not? It's kosher for me. That's, yeah. that's what I care yeah. about. I get uh, O-U. I, want, I, OU's I don't want to offend you. I have to get an O-N or something. O-N. <laughs> well, so now... That might be no, but no, it's okay. You O-C. Are now, for, you are a rabbi of this minion now. Yes. Is it still the same old thread of Elichaim and Shlomo running and Naftali running through it? How do you maintain that kedusha, sort of? In terms of Naftali, I never met him, so I can't say there's a certain vibe here that's still the same. But I can tell you that there's that that the there's something about the certain quality about the shul that um, we don't get it all the time, and we certainly um, aspire to get it. And I know when we're not quite getting it, and where we're not quite getting it, I could even tell you, but maybe I won't. But it's still here. There's still that. Spirit, it's here. Their 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 residue, their their reshima, their their light, if you would say, continues to shine here. And uh, having both no, you know, have a connection to both of them as as family and as a student also, and having a lot of other people who have spent time, many of them more time than me, with uh, with Rosh Shlomo and and some with Rabbi Chaim. And continuously bringing them back into the shul to help. Every Shabbos, um, almost there's a guest. There's, there's a, a lot of guest speakers who come. Not only guest speakers who come and says, "Oh, I used to be here," yeah. and and they kind of pilgrimage. Yeah, to, not to just the, shul. the official guest speakers. It's a lot of old timers. They move away, but they always come back. Very right. few people stay away forever and ever. I mean, there's some people. I won't know that they were here 25, 35 years ago because they never come in again, but there are a lot of people... Like me. <laughs> ...who will wander back in. Yeah. You're a perfect example. Yeah. Well, it's a place that gave a lot of people a sense of home. It's like a bridge between home and heaven. A home is many things. A home is like you say, I feel at home. You don't mean I have my microwave and my you know, suitcases. Comfortable. But feel, no, I feel, feel right I feel, there. I feel accepted. I feel welcome. I feel whole. And I think there is something of this shul that gave people a, a connection to that. I asked Neshama before, how do you f- define spiritual? Dumb it down to people. Yeah. And I wonder how would you put it? She said, any feeling you have about yourself is spiritual. Tell me how you see the whole spiritual business, how do you explain it? How do you connect with it? Because halacha and orthodoxy don't necessarily prepare you for that, even though that's supposed to be the actual ruchniot, it's supposed to be it, but we have so many rules. How do you break that? Let's say you take a look at, we're, we're talking to each other, and you can ask a question, I think about what is the question, or how I should answer it, and that's a conversation, that's a communication. 
But if I also know, like I look at you for a moment, I say, Sally, you have a neshama. You're, you're, not, you're not just a bundle of ideas, random or, or, or thought out, or there's something about you that is divine. That's, you're, you're created really? in the image of God, right? It's, wow. it's not just your physical. You're beautiful, you're wonderful, but it's more than just your physical appearance. It's really... And, and all you need to do is say that, and then you'll see an, a certain kind of light. I don't mean light, like lighting light, but you'll see a certain... A wake up. A certain difference in attitude, yeah. An awakening. An awakening, yeah, yeah. And you could do it even with a room. You could even... that. You can actually literally look at a room, and I believe that the holier a person is, a leader, let's say, can create an atmosphere where some of the followers will actually see the entirety of the room full of souls. Are you doing this here on Shabbos? When, when, you, when you rabbi here, do you do that? Occasionally, I feel that just the nigan itself and the melodies itself. See, that's a great metaphor also because the melody is just singing. It's a physical reality. But when you harmonize together, something clicks in and takes over. And that's why a lot of people, when they hear beautiful singing, they think of angels. What is this, what is this to do? Mm -hmm. Angels singing. Because it's otherworldly. It elevates them. It eleva they, feel, they feel a little closer to the neshama. So that's another example. That's a gateway. I consider music, like people say marijuana is the gateway drug to, music to, to more dangerous things. I say music, if you're an atheist, you shouldn't listen to music. <laughs> because it, it's the gateway to, to spiritual experiences. Right. It's the gateway. So that I actually feel that all the music that we do here as wonderful as it is, it's to get people to open up. Beyond that, there's many, many other doors that can be opened. So you just helped me to formulate a little difference between Reb Shlomo and others. Maybe even you, I don't know. So you said sometimes, right? Yes. You also mentioned that Shlomo had no boundaries. Shlomo never... Well, everybody has. Yeah. Even Shlomo yeah. had boundaries. Shlomo never stopped connecting I think that's what defines him. People like get up, they do their thing, do their thing, they create a connection, and they leave. Then they sit down or leave. Yeah. Shlomo he was never, always on. He was always, he was on. always on. He was. So in a sense, you could not. Or he go, was asleep. <laughs> you could not go back to yourself. Yeah. And actually, it elevated people because they didn't want to go back to themselves. Yeah. Yeah. They knew themselves. He says, "Oh." Return, 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 so return to what? I'm yeah. returned to you. I, you own me. It, it, it's yeah. a great, that was his trick. He never stopped. He was on all the time. He was on all the time. And he... Uh... Could you do that? No. Do you choose to? I admire Shlomo's qualities, but I don't aspire to be his clone. So talk about clone. We didn't talk or, about clone. I've been here in Shabbat yeah. and I hear you get up yeah. and you say something very inspiring and very thoughtful, but I feel that also you're holding back. You have Is to hold you have to hold back. <laughs> but could you not hold back? If you didn't hold back, what would happen? You know what it is in life we have lots yeah. of we have lots of walls that we create. We don't right. reveal everything that's within us. Even spiritually speaking, we have certain wellsprings. And for whatever reason, for example, the, the PSS, the Rebbe, says there's a certain wellspring, and we usually only tap into it on Yom Kippur. The average Jew all of a sudden feels really inspired on Yom Kippur and really is soaring. And, uh, but he says the truth is it's there all the time. So could We're you, holding ourselves back. So of course. Of course. I don't know that I'm... Do you do it consciously? Well, I think we all have lots of, of boundaries that we have up all so the coming, time. Coming this Shabbos, you're going to be here, right? Yes. So you're going to think about, oh, Rabbi Israel told me that I'm holding back. Let me not hold back. Are you going to go a well, step further? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest with you. This is something I actually shared this, this Saturday, this Shabbat. When I study Torah, there's a part of us studying Torah that's just processing information. It's difficult material. A lot of times right. it's new, or if it's not literally the first time, you haven't done it in a few years. It's, let's say, the Talmud. You're trying to just figure out 
what it is. So you're spending a lot of time just trying to get it. We spend very little time trying to get it on the next level, like get it to where it really speaks to you. It's not just information, but it's coming, it's got that otherworldly quality. It's got that divine, that spirituality. That's what the Baal Shanta was saying. You've got to study Torah, not just as an idea, not just as some history or some, some philosophy, but as something that has a divine light in it. We hold ourselves back. Partially is we're, we're, it's almost like if you're building a home, you forget to make it where you live. <laughs> you're you're um, creating, you're, you're getting ready for a wedding, but you don't know what it's really like to be married. Right? So it's like partially we're students of the Torah. Students of life. Yeah, but we're, it's almost like we don't have enough time to get to the core. It's like, imagine being in a relationship and you're so busy, you're so preoccupied with just like the checklist of what needs to be done to physically be able to like put in the time. And you need to do that. But you never get to like relax and just be in it. In its purest, most inner sense. Is it your goal? Sometimes. <laughs> Like a true Jew. Sometimes, yeah. And your children? Thank God. Uh, and Hara, they should, you know, they should, they should be blessed. And, and, How old uh, are they now? They're 20, 16, and 12. And do they follow in your uh, spiritual you know, journey? Each one is so unique. I'm, I'm so blessed that each one is... When they came out, when they were just born, you could already tell that they're, like, different. Yeah, who they are. Names? My oldest is Eliyahu, and then the next one is Naomi Esther, and the little one is Chayat Chari. Wow, three cherries. Yeah. If they hear you talk about holding back, how can you tell them to go all the way? I can't. It has to come from them anyway. Do you think that there's a metronome, the pendulum? Absolutely. One, one is going all the way Absolutely. this way, then Absolutely. it goes out that way? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think there's... This is Abraham, which in Kabbalah represents love, gave birth to Isaac, which is awe. So there's like this pendulum. It swings and maybe a little bit too much, and he had to bring it back to the other direction. And then Jacob is compassion, so he's bringing it to a third, yet a third place that combines the other two directions. So for sure. So maybe Isaac dug the wells in the middle so Jacob can be there. And each one, it's almost... I think it's very important, each one of us, even if we seem to be very opposite of each other, we, we bring something out. And sometimes it is important to be strong, even if it seems to be a little bit extreme, because then we get somewhere. As long as we have a chance to explain ourselves, like right now. That's what you're doing, you're doing great work. So I'll wait. Uh, Thank you. What was it? Zecher Naftali or Yad Naftali? Zecher Naftali, yeah. yeah. yeah that was, he said that my, my grand, my father, meaning right, my, right, right. Alchayim's father, Naftali, my great grandfather, right. he wasn't a chassid. So I needed, so my grandfather would say, I needed to make sure he had. He wrote chassid. those books, right? Zecher Naftali. So my grandfather wrote or commissioned the books to be written in the memory of his father. Zecher Naftali. So that way, at least, yeah, my, right. at least in, in his father's memory, Hasidic books would be written. Well, he himself, the Naftali Kaaba, was not a classic. So there's one thing that I do on every interview I've done, and I ask you to sing something from Beit Saba, something that mm. is giving you not just a song, a Hebrew song, but something that connects you to the Tish, to the Rambinic, to learning, to anything. Too many words. So my grandfather would sing uh, Shalom Aleichem. It's actually a Satmar Nigan. I didn't know that, I just knew he was a beautiful Nigan. Uh, in fact, one time I had two ex satmers on my Shabbos table, and they were so angry at the community they were from. They said, everything in that community is ugly. I said, what about the Shalom Aleichem? They said, oh, you're right, that's beautiful. So that's your... your <laughs> so so I'm sure there's a lot of beautiful things in Satmer, but uh, this is a song that my grandfather would sing on Friday night. Shalom Aleichem 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 Oi malachay, I'm a bellyoy. I mean, ye, 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 
And it would go on like that. You had like different stanzas. One more time. That is, remember that. That is the 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 Elichayim we used to lean left. Yeah. What a, what a what a beautiful. So, do you sing it to yourself like this? I do that some of the time, but because Shlomo's tune for Shlomo was easier, we do that one. Just can't catch it. So we gotta. We do it all. We do it all. Sally, thank you. Uh, thank you for everything.